Hi, I'm Mike Cowell. I'm the director of the Business Innovation Zone. The Business Innovation Zone, or the Biz, was created to help high growth potential entrepreneurs and businesses in central Iowa. We provide a variety of services, including mentoring, consulting, counseling, validating business models, and help with access to funding for high growth companies. We offer also a number of networking opportunities, including luncheons uh, once a month and all-day seminars on subjects such as marketing and finance. You can find out more about the biz at www.bizci.org. Well, I, uh, I tried to put this together and make this more about kind of my story and less about Dwala. Um, how many of you guys have heard of Dwala before? I always like to ask that question, and that makes me feel really good. It makes me feel like I am doing my job. Uh, you know, who I am, um, I grew up in Cedar Falls. Um, basically, you guys know where like Beaver Hills is? I grew up on a farm out in Beaver Hills where I didn't farm, but my dad rented the land out. Um, I'm a UNI dropout. Uh, I went to UNI for a semester. I enrolled in the second semester, but I kind of stopped going to class. Um, I didn't do that because I didn't value education. I did that because I was building stuff and that got me really excited. Um, I started a company while I was in college. It started making a little bit of money. Um, and to be quite honest, I thought I started making more money after six months doing that than I would after a four-year degree. So in my own naivety, which I'm maniacally naive, I believe that I can do what I start. I don't know why, but I believe that if I just start and I just try, and if I don't get up, I will build it. I don't know where that came from, but that's just something that's hardwired into me. So what qualifies me to be here? Douala is not really my most successful project at all. There's another company that came before it, which was much more successful, much faster than Douala was. That company basically, over time, has employed more than 100 people, not at once. We employed more than 100 people, and that was before I was 22 or 23. So um, I do have experience managing teams. I do have experience with software development, manufacturing, uh, tooling, uh, international business relationships. We were distributed all over the world. Um, and the stuff that I've always done, which is really what the rest of this is about, is about stuff that came out of my head. I, I don't know why, but I'm really bad at taking like a spreadsheet and saying, this is how you're gonna make money, Ben. Um, I guess I always kind of have an idea of, forget that, I don't wanna do that. You know, I wanna make this, or I wanna play with clay and I want it to be this color, but I don't have that color clay, but by God, I'm gonna make different colored clay and that's gonna be part of my plan. That's just kind of how it always works. So what qualifies me to be here is that I'm, I'm pretty decent at just figuring out how to make a living out of the stuff in my head and stuff that I want to do and doing it sometimes on my own terms. Um, how I got here was I came to Des Moines. I met Joe Hinkey. Go meet Joe Hinkey if you want to meet people. Um, and he introduced me to Mike. Mike introduced me to Christian and it sent me pretty much on a whirlwind for a year of, I mean, if you had money in town or if you have money at any given time, I probably pitched you over that period of a year probably like three or four times. And hopefully my pitch got better every time. Um, but basically all I did was run around and pitch. Um, that was what happened. Uh, you know, my first project was Elemental Designs and it was a speaker manufacturing company that I started while I was at UNI. Um, I had a little bit of experience selling speakers in high school. Basically in journalism class, I'd write my article in like 15 minutes and I'd sit on the computer and sell speakers on the internet. Um, which got drop shipped out of a speaker shop in California and then we just drop ship it around the world. Um, so basically if you bought like an Alpine CD player off the internet, um, you were never getting it from a real warehouse. It was being drop shipped out of like a shop in California. Like four shops did it and I got in with one. So selling speakers seemed like a good idea. Um, that company went from $1,200 investment, which I got by, I sold my instruments on eBay to get the money for that company and uh, went to about a million dollars in your revenue in just over four years. Um, we did that without outside financing, without really knowing what we were doing, and just by sitting on the computer and hustling. Um, now when I say hustling, we weren't hustling people at all, we were just working ourselves to the bone. Um, when we were at a million dollars in sales, we were at four employees. Um, you know, we were working hard, we had great markup, um, and basically after that happened, I didn't know what to do with it. My idea for my life was, White House, a couple foreign cars, dog, pretty girl. I got it and it really sucked a lot. <laughs> um, so that's where I was 21, 22, all of a sudden I had money I didn't know what to do with and I thought this is what I wanted and it was gonna make me happy. I pretty much was totally miserable. Um, I made everybody around me totally miserable. The company stopped growing because I didn't know what to do with it because I just believed that, well, if you got 
seven figures on your bottom line, then there's enough markup in that that, oh, go buy something, make yourself happy, man, shut up. And after I did that for like a year, I got bored, uh, really unhappy, and then I started spending a lot of time in Asia. It just so happened that uh, my partners or my distributors or my suppliers that were supplying me, um, basically I would pay them, they were US companies to do work for me, and they wouldn't pay their suppliers in Asia. Well, that really pissed me off, so I just went to Asia and started talking to their suppliers. I just cut them out. So for three years, I'd spend about three months out of the year in Asia, just working on tooling, new projects, things like that. Um, then I realized I didn't want to be in Asia anymore. I didn't like it. Um, it just wasn't my environment. What actually makes me happy is Iowa, and you know, I kind of joke that sometimes cornfields are my beach, and um, you know, I covet a four-wheeler, not a boat. So I sold the company once because I had no idea what I wanted in life. The sale fell through while I was walking in to sign the final uh, documents. So I failed at that, that felt really bad. I basically stayed and ran the company for another year trying to figure out what to do with it, my life and everything else. Uh, selling the second time was I took my employees out into a soccer field slash corn field and I said, I don't wanna be here anymore, I'm really unhappy. I made them an offer, they accepted, I sold the company. So that's how I got out of my first company. So project two, basically project two is Dwala. It comes out of an idea or a problem that we had at Elemental Designs, which was something that we were constantly doing, obviously, was taking in money through our website. So we had to pay the interchange fee on all the money we got coming in. The problem we wanted to solve was we wanted to get paid through our website in a secure way that allows us, allowed us to keep more of our money or bypass the interchange. And we started going out and asking people, well, how could we do this, looking at some other options. We couldn't find one, so, um, we pitched a bank and um, they accepted, allowed us to kind of start doing some testing. So we started moving money through that financial institution, which was Midwest One, which at the time was Iowa State Bank and Trust, if you guys are familiar with that bank. Um, I think the reason that Dwala gets a lot of attention is we've taken in some capital. Um, you know, I think that we have a long way to go to really prove ourselves, and a lot of it is about naivety. You know, people ask a lot, well, if you knew about money transmitter regulation, would you have gotten started with it? Hmm, probably not, but I didn't know, so, man, I just did. Um, you know, I joke that uh, an $8 million problem I discovered reading a book called PayPal Wars, and then I called the bank and I said, hey, do we need this? And the bank was like, oh, I don't know, do you? So, I mean, then we kind of had to work it out and figure it out, and that took us a year. Um, you know, I put failure in here because, you know, a lot of people look at Dwala like we have this overnight thing going on, but I've been working on this for two and a half years. Um, I mean, there are a lot of times when a lot of people in my personal life, in my professional life, no one really got it. And, um, you know, if you want to build a company and you want to really do it on your own and you just want to do something because that's what's in your head, I mean, you got to understand that not everybody's always going to support you, not every day is going to be great. So, failure and hustle. When I screw up and I fail, I just keep going um, because quite frankly, I'm too committed. Um, so one of the things that was put in there was how to attract attention as a company. And I don't, I don't really know. I don't have a grand marketing scheme. I don't have, well, if we do this, we're gonna acquire this many eyeballs, this many eyeballs gives us this many users, this many users gives us this much revenue off 10 years, I don't know. Um, I just kind of get up in front of people, ramble and try and tell my story. Um, and I think the most important thing about it is just be yourself. I mean, if you aren't yourself, it's gonna come out, and you know, it's kind of, this is, this is who I am, and the, how many of you guys know Sharice? I kind of joked. Sharice told me like I need to change shirts before I'm meeting at two. So, you know, it's you gotta just be yourself. Um, I, I like to say respectfully disrupt the status quo. I think disruption is important in the sense of if there's gonna be return. Um, because significant returns and value can be created through disruption. But you can't just disrupt by going out and taking a dump in everybody's office and expecting to keep getting a meeting. It just doesn't happen like that. And a lot of people think that being disruptive means being disrespectful, which it doesn't. You can disrupt and be respectful, and you really need to learn how to do the two at the same time. Um, I do feel like I've been allowed to stay in a lot of rooms because even if our ideas are not the same, and even if maybe we are disruptive to a current model, we've allowed ourselves to find ways just basically through patience of communicating that without being arrogant. And I think that's really smart. Um, that and just learn to pitch. Tell your story and just keep it getting shorter, 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 and it'll eventually be refined. And when somebody tells you your pitch sucks, just say, okay, I'll be back in a week. Um, <laughs> you know, and then show back up in a week. 
You know, this is one thing that about Douala has been, was a really big epiphany for me, was when I was building my first company uh, and we kind of hit a uh, certain point, especially with revenue, I thought, well, I don't have to listen to anybody anymore. Look at this, I can do whatever I want. I can get on a plane and go to Asia. You know, it seemed like I had all this freedom and I kind of hit me really early in life. That's, that's just kind of not what it's about. And um, I guess, you know, I put up these pictures because Douala is not successful just because I work hard. It's successful because of the people around us I think have supported us and you can't really see it but I mean when we throw events like a hundred or a couple hundred people show up and um, a lot of them are smiling, some are wearing Douala t-shirts, everybody's working on an ecosystem, everybody's building and I feel like Douala is part of something significantly more. You know it's kind of got this idea that all of a sudden we have the idea of the Silicon Prairie and largely because of Jeff Wood and the guys at Silicon Prairie News and because of Christian and Mike and Tej and guys that are building and supporting people like me. You know, it's, it's about the community and it's about more than just you. So make your project about more than just you because if it's about you and it's about money, then you suck and leave. Sorry, I don't want to tell anybody to leave. It's just, you know, with that said, raising money in Des Moines is very interesting because Des Moines is a system, well, obviously there's money available, but you have to want to do it in Des Moines for some reason or another. Maybe you're from here. Maybe you want to say you just did it here. Maybe. Maybe you think the cost of doing business here is really worthwhile, so raising capital here is exactly what you want to do. Uh, you, you really have to understand that raising money and doing that type of venture inside of Des Moines is not necessarily typical. It is not something that when they, your friends or people in your personal life go to, you know, kind of their social connections, no one's really going to get what you're doing. In fact, most people are going to think you're highly irrational, even if you think you've thought it through really well, and they're going to start treating you like it, which means you're probably going to be somewhat of an alien whenever you tell anybody about what you do. So accept it. That's, that's the fact about Des Moines and raising money in Des Moines and in the Midwest. Now, I put in here the investor pool may not understand here, and you probably won't understand them. Again, it's because our roadmap is unclear here. We don't have enough history to be able to pull from one another and understand the roles that each one of us play. Maybe one person invests in biosciences and maybe you're pitching them a technology company that has nothing to do with biosciences, so you're, you shouldn't be in their portfolio. You know, maybe another company starts investing in later stage stuff and wants to say they do startup stuff, but you don't have any access to their portfolio or any of their other founders, so you have no idea what you're even pitching. So I got into a uh, kind of a interesting roadmap where I was just running around town pitching anybody that would listen. Well, it wasn't until I figured out, well, maybe that was a dumb idea. I mean, it took me a year, but you know, it just wasn't productive. So something to be aware of is that, you know, try and get to know who you're pitching beforehand. And you need to understand you're part of something here in Des Moines that's relatively new. And, um, you know, while this isn't, you know, we always have these like ideas of this isn't Silicon Valley or anything like that. I mean, it's not, but it still has a lot of value and we just need to learn to recognize its value. So this was, I had to use Charlie Sheen in this. There's always, you know, there's always that one guy who just like sours the room before he leaves because he has to have the last word. And um, Des Moines is a small town. Uh, it's really well connected to Kansas City and Omaha too. Just don't be that guy. You know, if you don't agree, respectfully disagree. And you can't be the guy who knows everything and arrogant and rude and everything else just because you're so smart and expect to get anywhere. It just isn't gonna happen here. Um, you know, I put this in, when will it get better? Like how do we solve it? I don't really know. I do know that it's either gonna take a emotional charge from local investors, probably spawned by a return from outside investors into a company that's here that they should have invested in, or I think that on the other side, when somebody has a quality exit, which means there's an exit of a company where they have enough money to essentially bring some sort of cash to the local ecosystem to where all of a sudden there's groundswell around that company so that other startups can spawn out of that company. So, you know, mentors and so on and so forth can start helping other startups. And I think that we have the beginnings of all these things right now. We just haven't kind of hit over the top. Um, you know, I think that there are uh, a lot of things that we can do to kind of help things along. And one of them is don't be afraid to start talking to people outside of town. If you limit yourself to investors specifically in Des Moines, they're gonna know that. So why are you putting up a wall for your project to be unsuccessful? I mean, open the bidding pool a little bit. Get outside of town. Um, and I'm not saying leave. I'm not at all. I'm still here, I love it. Um, you know, another thing I've run into sometimes is because people decide they wanna raise money, they think they should just get it. And that's not the way it goes. 
And just accept up front that you have to create value in order to receive value. That's all there is to it. And I always like this idea, and this always worked well for me, is be your first investor. Lead by example. And you know, I couldn't afford to lead by example in our last round, but I did initially, and I did in the one before that. And when we raised, um, we raised a quarter million dollars from Angels with Dwalla, uh, and I was the first 50 in, and I will absolutely be the last money out. Absolutely, there's no question about that. Um, so it is to say that I feel like you can validate yourself to a lot of people just by simply saying, I'm willing to put in what I'm asking from you. And I'm right there, and I'll even put in writing that you get, you, you can be out first, that's fine, because I have confidence because this is my project. And drop me an email, because I will, I mean, if it doesn't suck, I'll just make sure you get in front of anybody who matters in town um, as quickly as I can, because there are people that are looking, there are people who want to do deals, we just got to try and figure out how to do it. So I guess inside of Des Moines, these things I think will kill you really quickly, so try not to do them. Um, I think lack of execution is a lot of the stuff where it's you know, over-promising and under-delivering. I think we're all guilty of it at some point in our lives, but I think there's those of us who become really well known for that, um, and that's not something you want to do because the introductions will stop when that happens, and if introductions stop, you're dead. Um, you know, again, not putting in uh, what your investors put in. The last two are really just you know, character flaws that we all need to be um, self-aware of. And I think that it's really easy, especially when you're trying really hard at something, to start justifying your lack of success or lack of whatever you're trying to accomplish by, well, they just don't get it, and there's no way, or these guys are jerks, and you know, I'm guilty of it too. I'm, I'm absolutely guilty of it. And I think that you really just need to try and be self-accountable that Maybe if you're not being successful, or maybe if you're not raising the money, or maybe if they didn't get it, maybe you need to refine your pitch. Maybe you need a little bit more work. Maybe you're talking to the wrong people. I mean, take responsibility for it. So I guess with all these things, and I'm presenting all these problems, and so on and so forth, why here? Um, you know, I guess I believe that this is my home. I believe it can get better. I want to do it here. Um, you know, if I feel like if it's go broke or leave, I will leave but I believe that there's still a lot of opportunity here, and a lot of how we found opportunity is relationships, introductions, partnerships, and just looking at that very seriously. In Iowa, I think it was probably pretty rare for you just to get a million dollar check from somebody if they're not actually utilizing your product, um, and that was something that took me a while to understand. So look for people who can essentially be um, customers of yours, who might be able to help finance while they use the product and create value for both companies. Um, you know. Partnerships were really good for us. That's how we kind of did our last deal with Dwalo was um, we have a financial institution and a bank processing company that were extremely important to not only our regulatory structure, but in terms of getting our product to market. Uh, so they have become a significant part of our user base and also a significant part of our distribution channel. All really good things for us. So it was worth a lot more than money. And I think that that's one thing that Iowa is really great in is the doors are open, take advantage of them, and just keep kind of talking. Um, this is pretty much what I kind of just went over, but you know, smart money is kind of the way that I've always heard it described in terms of who can use your product, how can they see a return simply by adopting it. So with Dwalla, a good example would be, well, what if a financial institution adopted Dwalla? And what if that financial institution, if X percentage of their users or of their clients utilize the platform, what would that inherently make Dwalla worth? Well, that's all numbers, but it actually makes a lot of sense and has a lot of value in the marketplace. So if we can create value that re, you know, creates instant return on investment just by picking the right investor, that's good for everybody, right? So just consider what you can accomplish by taking the right money. Don't take money from just anyone. Um, I guess one thing I've learned is that taking money from people, if they're not providing you value as well, just simply doesn't make sense and money is not alone enough value. Um, not if you're gonna put your whole life into it. Um, I kind of put this stuff up because I think a lot of people give me a lot of credit because Dwala's name pops up all the time. Um, I, I really, on paper, I'm not a smart guy. Uh, I struggle a lot with school, I do. Obviously, I'm sure you can tell by listening to me, I bounce all over the place all the time. Um, but you know, I surround myself with really intelligent people. And I try to be self-aware that when they know something I don't, maybe I can learn from them rather than just always continually telling them the way they should be doing it. And I think that's always allowed me to raise my game. And I think if I can take credit for something, it's that I know how to work hard. If the server's down, I won't sleep for 40 hours. If people are unhappy, I'll stay up and talk to you. If we don't have emails that are answered, I'll sit there and I'll email back. You know, I, I say, 
you know, send us a text. Well, the people at work are too busy, so tonight, anybody who sent me a text, I'm gonna sit down and I'm gonna answer them all personally. So I know how to work, and I'm not looking for other people to do the work for me, and I think that alone has what allowed me to just simply maybe just get a little further than other people. So we have this concept of Silicon Prairie, and I think that's really just the area and the region and how we all grow it together. And how do we connect to one another on a roadmap that allow us to find investors, find mentors, find access to other founders, and find access to money? And that's really just it. If you can't find access to people who can help you, you can't find access to people who can help finance you, and you can't find access to like-minded people, why would you stay? So if we're all here, maybe we just need to be a little bit more um, self-aware that we can put or we can get together, and there are events going on right now to kind of learn who one another are. Look at Tech Brew, Silicon Prairie News, just read that all the time, hit the events, startup drinks, um, and anything that has Startup Weekend or Startup City's name on it, just go. Even if you don't know what you're doing, just go and support it because inherently it'll be good for the community and you should be doing it. Um, as we kind of grow as a community, everybody's gonna get jobs, everybody's gonna get revenue, taxes will increase, and everybody wins. So anytime you kind of see the term Silicon Prairie, just go out of your way to support it. It's good for all of us. So I also put this up in, up here because it took me a long time to kind of figure out what I wanted out of life. And for me, I do know that even though I understand the irony of our company moves money and yada, 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 it's not about the money. I figured that out at one point because I got enough that it didn't make me happy and hey, well that seems obvious, but not to me at the time. So, you know, you're starting this company, you're swinging really big, you're putting all your time into it, you're burning all your personal relationships, your family doesn't get it, you dropped out of school, why are you doing this? Money's not gonna be enough. Um, and I think that when you start your project, just be self-aware that knowing what you wanna get out of this is, is paramount because that's what's gonna get you out of bed and keep you building every day. And you know, I realize that it's not necessarily about one specific company, but for me, I just want the freedom to, to, to create the stuff I want to create and be surrounded by good people who help me do it. And again, I really want a four-wheeler really bad. <laughs> um, so I'm hoping I get that this year. I think the biggest mistake I made, at least so far, was I aligned myself, at least with my first company, with bad um, um, partners who essentially were supplying me with product that you know, I wasn't really paying attention to their motivations and they started supplying me with bad product. They stopped paying their vendors and it started affecting my supply chain. Um, and I lost a tremendous amount of money because of it and because I was the only investor and the only partner, it was all my money. Um, so I think that I put maybe too much faith in some people because I wanted the deal to be so good that I just didn't do enough due diligence to really fully understand what I was getting myself into. I mean, when I said I was naive, I really wasn't kidding, and that's bit me a few times. You just have to define, failure is just part of, part of life, and you, none of us are perfect, right? And sometimes failure is not getting the 100 users you wanted or the 1,000 users you wanted, and sometimes it's screwing up with socks. I don't know, but either way, we're all going to inherently fail, and when we have to accept that, it doesn't make failure something that we can just justify, but you just have to accept that it happens and then just take responsibility for it and move on. And I just think that being able to, in your head, realize that it's okay, that you didn't get a 10 out of a 10 this time, but having the courage to say, forget that, I'm going back and I'm gonna get an 11. And then going back and just doing it until you do. If you, if you ever, do any of you guys read like Fred Wilson's blog or any, anything like that? I mean, they're talking about like all the competition for talent and everything else and all these ridiculous signing bonuses and everything else. And I mean, it's really good to make money, right? But if you're not, if you're not executing, what's the point? And I think that one, Iowa is a really great place to be starting a company. I mean, had we raised a million dollars from a financial institution and we were in California, would anybody be in this room? Probably not. But because we did it in Iowa and because maybe it hasn't been done here before, it's more interesting. So will that help us in finding really talented people to work with? I think so. Will that allow us to maximize potential return on investment? Absolutely, I think so. And because we're here, we have access to a lot of financial and processing information that otherwise we never would have. I mean, Des Moines and Omaha are extremely strong in payments. And because of that, we've been able to gain access to just ridiculously intelligent people that have really helped us out. So I think that when, you know, that question is kind of always met with a laugh, but then why are we here? And why does it make good business sense? And why is that the right choice for us over a five or 10 year period? All of a sudden, it's about business, it's not about opinion. And, well maybe business is opinion, but you know, they've actually been pretty supportive of it.
I mean, I learned very early in life that I shouldn't spend more money than I have. Um, the only reason I ever got a credit card was because my dad had to sign my lease on my car because I had no credit and that was really embarrassing for me. So I got a credit card to like build credit history. You know, it just kind of, that, that piece of advice has really served me really well in life. There's a lot of pieces of advice that have been, that have caused really significant turning points in my life, especially with Dwala, uh, especially with very well connected people that just said do it this way or do it this way. Um, but overarching is just don't spend more money than you have. Uh, well, I mean, I'm not talking about the 20 ideas I've had that didn't work. I mean, so, I mean, it's, it's all relative, right? And I think that um, obviously there comes a time when you have to commit to one long enough to have some sort of validation to not only you, but the people around you. And I think that um, for me, what drives me is market interest. So it's kind of like if I put six months into something and really nobody cares, I probably won't keep working on it. But if I put six months into it and we're in the newspaper a few times and this bank is interested and we raise some money and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, man, I'm gonna ride that until I just, I wear out. So I think that for me, it's always been about letting the market really tell me what it wants. And if it doesn't want what I have to offer, I just kind of don't do it. And that's why the other 20 was what we're not talking about today. Looking like a young yeah, I think the beauty of the startup community is it's defined on execution and results rather than on seniority. And if you have seniority and you fail to execute, you don't matter. Which is, I guess, one reason why I really like that community. And it's just, it's all driven on results. And in terms of a corporate environment, I wish I had a good answer. Um, but I think maybe that's one reason why maybe I wouldn't work real well in a super corporate environment. <laughs> and, you know, I hope that as our company grows, we can foster a culture of respect, but also innovation. I'm not really sure how we're gonna do that long term. You know, we have guidelines for how we want to treat one another, but they're things like, don't be a jerk, no spitting. <laughs> you know, I, I'm not really sure. And I oh, think that if, exactly you know, if, um, if you reject, you know, your environment, you know, start a company, just run with it. Any other questions? Awesome. Thank you very much. Hey, thank you.